All right, so here we're going to get started with data types. So we've talked about a lot of different ones, but let's go into a few more, the more advanced. So first we'll go into is date time. And with date time, the main way you're going to use it is the year, month, day. So let's go over to MATLAB and look at this. If I run this, I get a datetime class. If I pull up the class right here, it's datetime. And it's got 3rd of March 2000 in here. Uh, so 3rd or the 1st of March 2000 would be this, right? It's the year, the month, the day. But it works a little bit different than you might expect if I said the 50th day in March, it rolls it over effectively to April. So if I do the 30th days in March, we're good. 31st, also good. But 32nd, it rolls it over into April. And if I did the 13th month in 2000, it'll roll over to 2001. Right. And then the 32nd would mean it'd roll over to February and be the first. So that's how date time works. You can also feed in a matrix. So if I wanted all of the, let's change this, first month, first day from the years 2000 to 2022, I could do that with this. It just creates my matrix. 1st of January 2000, 1st of January 2001, 1st of January 2002, and so on. And then if I wanted to give more values with the month and the day, like if I wanted months 1 to 12, then it'll give me an error because I have to either match. So I either have to have year 1, year 2, year 3, with a corresponding day for year one, day for year two, day for year three, corresponding with this year, this, or these would be month. So I have my year one, month for year one, and then I could either give it a day or I could give it a corresponding day for each uh, position here. So in order to get all of the months from the years 2000 to 2022, I'd have to use a loop or something to actually construct that because that's not what date time will expect. Now we'll move into struct. So the way this one works, you can use the period to call up certain elements in something. So let's just say I want to create a variable called variable. And I want it to house like a time. So let's have it have some date time, some value, and we could give it a string to describe it. So what I could do here is I could for a variable use the period to then put an element in that structure and that would be a field. So the field I want for this is the, and this would be date time uh, let's just have it be 2000, uh, first month, first day. And the value at that time is a random number between 0 and 100. And the string is just a description. So this is a random number. So when I run this, give me an error, check for missing or extra characters. Oh, this is not supposed to be there. Okay, so variable, and then it's got the fields time, which is the date time I gave it, value, which is the value I gave it, the random number, and the string is the description that I gave it. So it's just a structure, and it's got several different elements here that I can work with. And as you can see, unlike matrices, you don't have to have the same data types, right? This is a double, this is a date time, and this is a string. So you can fit lots of different data types into the same variable. You just can't fit it into the same matrix. You have to use a structure or something else. 
And the next thing we'll look at is an alternative to structures for housing multiple things in the same variable. And this is much like a matrix, it's a cell. And a cell is effectively a matrix, but it holds other data types within it. So instead of brackets, which is a matrix, I'll use curly braces. And with the curly braces, I can fit in one, two, three, just like I could with a matrix. But instead of it having a one by three double, it would be one by three cell. And the one, two, three here, if I call up ants of one, the first value in that, it'll give me a cell with a matrix in it. And so if I wanted the position there, I would use curly braces instead of the parentheses. And with the curly braces, I can call up the first element in it. If I wanted second, I could get second. Ants, sir, is one, two, three. And answer of two is my two. So that's a cell. But as I said, you can fit multiple data types in it. So let's make it a string character and logical true. So now if I run this, you can see it uh, just like a matrix has to have the same number of rows each column, the same number of columns each row. So I can't just not have this here and try and make it so the first row is three columns and the second is two. It has to be a rectangle. It can't have missing parts there. So when I run this, it'll give me an error. If I put it back, here we are. I'm able to put multiple data types in this and I could have a matrix as well. So I can put that in there. As you can see, it works perfectly fine. And I could just call up the string just like I called up the numbers. So let's just call this val and the val row two, column one for the string. And there we go. I get my string. And it's just a string. It's not a cell. Whereas if I did val using the parentheses, I'll get my one by one cell with a string in it. So typically I'm going to want to call it up with curly braces. So that's a cell, another way to fit multiple data types into something. So now we've dealt with these built in functions. And I can see if I run this, there's my val, the class is cell type, right? But we also have the ability to make our own class types. So, and the way you do this is much like creating a function. So you'll go to a new file and instead of typing in function, blah, 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 you'll do class def. And this is short for defining a class and you'll just give it whatever name you want to call it. So just as functions, you can name this, whatever you want to call your class. So I'll call this test class, and then you can define the properties in it. So let's say I want the properties A, B, and C, and these are similar to the keys in a structure. So if A is a struct, so that A dot A is 11, A dot B is 12. The fields are A and B, just like there's that with structures, classes, basically, act like structures in the sense that these are like the fields or the properties for our class. So then I can end if those are all the properties I want. I can have as many in here as I like, but there we go, find our properties. Now we define our methods and methods are the functions that you can use within your test class. So let's say I wanted to add A and B together with a function in my class. I can say function just like I define a function in their own file. And then I say output, and this can be, of course, whatever you want to call it, but output, and then my function name. So sum a b, and then my inputs. But unlike normal inputs to a class function, you first feed in obj. This is calling up what your test class is. So to reference these properties, you feed in OBJ and then it will house these properties. So then I could feed in what other other whatever other inputs I want. But let's say I just want to add A and B together, so I don't need any other inputs. 
I can say output is obj because that's what the first position in the input to this function is my class, the actual class that I'm having here, a, b, and c. So obj.a plus obj.b. And then if I end all these, then I'll save this as test class because just like a function, I need to match the name of the file with the name of this class. So now I can make a variable with that class. So the way I do that is a equals test class. And then it automatically creates a test class class, uh, as you can see right here, which has the empty matrices because I haven't defined a, b, and c yet. So I could say a dot a is 11, a dot b is 15, a dot c is 23. And once I've defined those, as you can see, it kept the just like a structure. It kept when I said a dot a is 11, and then a dot b is 15. It updated it. It didn't just temporarily put it in when I specified that. So it's now got all these populated and I could say a dot sum a b and this could be output variable. When I run this, I'll create my new variable which has output to it obj dot a plus obj dot b and obj is a in this case because that's what my test class for this instance of my classes. So a dot a plus a dot b is of course 26. So when it output to the output variable, it output it as 26. And we can see output equals 26, but we don't have any output here. That's just because I didn't suppress this function in the class. And just like a normal function, when I run it, it doesn't put it in this workspace. It like has its own. It's only the output variable because that's what I actually defined in this workspace uh, to be the sum of these two parts of the object. I can also try and update. Let's say I wanted function output and let's say I wanted to mult C by two. And I just feed in the object again because or let's say I just want to multiply by some input. Then I can say output is obj.c multiply by input one. But I also want to actually update my c. So if I try obj.c is obj.c times input one. Let's press these and that second function and Right here, value class method that modifies object class must return the modified object. So the reason it's popping up this little concern here is because I didn't actually define this class properly. If I want to be able to revise the values inside here, I've got to make this a different type of class. And the one I'm looking for here is handle. So by feeding handle, you'll see that disappears. And that's because when I allow it to be a handle class type, then when in my functions, I update the OBJ, the properties of my instance of the test class, that will actually update it in the final thing. So if I created this without that, and I said var one is test class, and var one dot a is 11, var one dot b is 12, and var one dot c is 13. Now if I will var one, it's got all those. Let's say var two is equal to var one. So now if I tried to var one dot mult c, and let's say five, or let's say two. So it should be 26, right? And I can say output equals that. Uh, whoops, I need to do mult C by, I get 26. But if I pull up var one, it didn't actually update the dot C. Now, if I put handle here, 
it will. So there you can see that's how that will work. And we'll go into another example here. But one cool thing before we do that is this is a class type and we've got doubles, we've got cells that are built in. But for classes we create of our own, let's say we have, this is an example here, A is test class, B is test class, and we want to do A plus B. Well, this is a custom class. It doesn't know what to do when adding test class with another test class. So the way this can actually work is you can create another function in here and you can output when you want to do the addition you can do plus and a and b and a and b will be two test classes so let's say when you add one test class with another you want to just return the output of dot a with the second dot a so what i want to do here is output equals a dot a plus b dot a and end this now if i do var 1 plus var 2 we'll return 22 because var 1 a is 11 and var 2 a is 11 if i change var 2 a to be 15 then var 1 plus var 2 will now be 30. this var 1 var 1.a plus var 2.a is 30. So there we go. That's how you can actually use the operations. And that's because plus is, if I pull up the doc, plus plus is the same as using the function plus so if i define the function plus for this then i can do that so if i wanted to do the multiply i just pull up multiply is m times so i could say a new function here where m times is let's say dot multiply now, if I did var1 times var2, I get 225 because that's var1.a dot multiply var2.a. So there we go. That's how we can do that, create our own functions and stuff, or uh, functions within our class and use our properties. Now, let's look at an example. Let's say you want a class that is machine, and you want it to have a couple of aspects of the machine. So what do you care about with your machine is the type of machine, the position of the machine, the angle, and its size. Then you want to be able to perform a couple of different operations on the machine. You want to be able to rotate it. You want to be able to find the maximum x, and we'll just go over what, what we mean by that in a second, but let's say you want this. So you can create a class that is a machine that for a bunch of different machines, you can define all of these. And so to do that, let's flip back here and we can create a new class again. So class def, and we want to call it machine. There's no space there. Machine. And we want to include properties. Type. POS, short for position, angle, size, and our properties. And then we want methods, function, and we'll say output is define. And we just want to be able to quickly put in a type, position, angle, and size. So I'll put my OBJ here, of course, first, which will take in whatever this machine is. And then I can refer to this property as obj.type. And this one is obj.angle and so on. 
So then I can say in one, in two, in three, in four. And what this will do is I can say obj dot type is in one, obj dot os is in two, obj dot angle is in three, obj dot size is in four. I can end that. And if I just say this as my machine.m, of course, to match it, yes, I have another one to close it out, to save it as that. Save here, save, replace. There we go. So now let's just make it an empty output and suppress all of these. Now, if I use this, I can refer to my class just like I would anything else. So the machine, machine one is machine. When I run this, it creates an empty machine with type, position, angle, and size as all the data types. Then I could say machine one dot define because that's what I named my function here, dot define. Then I give it a type and let's say the type of machine is just a string and let's say it's a uh, CNC machine. Then let's say the position, let's give it an X, Y, Z, zero, zero, zero. Let's give it an angle of zero and a size of, let's give it an X, Y, Z, so it's 10 in X, 15 in Y, and five in Z, let's say. Now when I run this, now I've got machine one is machine, and because I didn't suppress it, it popped it out, but let's just suppress it for now. Then ants is empty. But if I look at machine, machine one, it didn't update it. That's because, of course, I didn't include handle up here. So when I do that, on this again, machine one, now it successfully updated it. So always remember if you're doing that to put handle there. But now let's include the actual stuff that we were wanting. So rotate, let's define output, the name of this function, which is rotate. And I just feed an OBJ, but I want an angle to rotate at. And this, and go in. Output is OBJ dot angle plus angle. So meaning with this function, I'm just saying rotate an additional amount of the input. And then I could just make my angle updated as well. OBJ dot angle is the same thing. And when I run this, I can say machine one dot rotate of a hundred. Now as is 100, but machine one is now at an angle of 100 when I defined it at zero here. If I define this at 10, then it'd be at 110. So that works great. That's one function accounted for. Now let's do one more. And we want that function. And realistically, we don't actually want outputs for these, right? So I can just take out these outputs and there's no problem at all. So if I comment this out, run this one more time, now I don't get the outputs because it's not outputting anything from dot define, which is probably how I want it. So just a note there, but I can go to my function and I want to find my maximum X and let's just call this max X course feed in obj and then let's say for our max x the way we're going to do this is by looking at our machine that we know is some dimensions that we gave it right and we'll just look at the x and y because we don't care about the height right now 
but we know it's at some position x, y. And let's say it's just defined at the bottom left corner for our machine. And then we have some extra x with the width here and the length and then our height we don't care about. So this maximum x is going to be x plus this dx, let's call it, which is our size. And we'll ignore the rotation right now. You could calculate out this hypotenuse, right, with this dx times the cosine of this angle. But we'll just say for now that uh, for our example function, we'll just say give it some error and the error will be how much we might be wrong in our position. So we know the width here, but maybe we're wrong about our x and y. So if we could be wrong in our x by 15, then we'll use that 15. And assuming we don't have any rotation there, we can say output obj dot pos. And then we'll look at the first position there. If our position is x, y, z, then obj dot position of one is our x. And then assuming we have no rotation, we can just do plus size of one, assuming of course, it's the same thing, x, y, z. And, oops, and then we want to add in the error. So for whatever additional error might be in our position measurement, for example. And of course, this is obj.size. So when I say this, run this, got machine one, and I can say machine one dot, what I called it, max x, max x, and then I feed in some error. Let's just say our, we know exactly where it is right now. So zero error. Then I get out 10 because it's at position zero. The size in x is 10. So if it's defined at this lower left hand corner, that's that maximum x here is 10. If I changed this to be 50 and machine one dot max x and I fed 15, then I can say, I know exactly what it's gonna be. It's gonna be this 50 plus this 10 plus the 15, which is of course 75. So when I run this, I will get out exactly that, 75. So that's how you can create your own custom class. And I could define a plus function if I wanted to be able to add two machines together, but maybe it doesn't make sense with this class to actually have addition as an operation. So that is that. Now we'll be moving on to uh, input and output and handling errors and different ways of managing your code running. So let's talk about handling running code. And the first thing we'll talk about is pause. And pause will work maybe like you'd expect. So if I do pause five, you can see it's running. It's not doing anything, but in a second, it finishes. So this pause five just pauses the program for five seconds. So for example, if you wanted to define something, A is 10, and then pause, you wanted it to pause for two seconds, and then say A is 20, you do exactly that, A is 10, pause for two seconds, then do A is 20. Of course, that doesn't change how the workspace is handling it, it just runs line by line, and then once this is updated to 20, it updates it to 20, but it just, if I cancel this, uh, with the control C, this A will still be 10 because it didn't run this until it would have gotten through the two seconds, which I stopped it before it got there. So let's pause. Next one is wait. 
And as with everything, I can pull up the doc. So doc weight. Well, weight of F suspends MATLAB execution until F is finished. So, so you can create this. Copy that, paste. Then I can use this to wait for that. So wait, that F. And to show you what it's doing, say it's one, is one, gets to the is one, waits, five seconds because of this, and then it does be as one. So this is a little bit more complicated, but it's another method of waiting. And you can do extra stuff with this, but we'll just keep it simple for now. So wait. Okay, so that was pause and wait, which are just stopping the code for a certain amount of time. Let's say now we want to schedule things to happen later. The way we can do this is with a timer. So what we want to do is we create a timer and then we give it the options here. Timer FCN. So this is what will run when the allotted time has passed. So let's say I want to do A is sine of 30. And let's do sine D, so it's degrees. Then I want to give it the amount of time that I want it to wait before it actually runs this timer. So this is the start delay. And let's say I don't want to run this for five seconds. Say this, run this, but I can express this. And what I want to do is do start T and wherever you put that start T, it will initialize the five seconds and then it will say A is sine D of 30 degrees, which is half. So there we are. That's how you can schedule things to happen later with a timer function for whatever you want to run in a string or set of characters there. Okay. Of note, once you're done with the timer, you do want to delete T. And then you can clear it as well. But for timers in particular, you do want to use the delete function. Okay, so that's scheduling. There's also timing of your code. So if you want to see how long something takes, we have three separate functions here. We have time it tick and talk. So to see how to use time it, we can pull doc time it. And as you can see by these examples, you can use just a function handle to run the function date gives us the date, right? So you can create function uh, in time it. It doesn't take in any inputs, so you can just feed in the F there and that'll determine or that it will tell you how long it takes to run that date function. Uh, you can also create your own function that isn't just an exact copy of date. If I wanted to like check how long it took to multiply two matrices, for example, uh, let's say element by element, then I could do my test is at no inputs, but it's a dot multiply by b. Let's press these. And I could do time it my test. Funk. And when I run this, it will tell me how long it took to actually run that. And it measures the time in seconds. So uh, it took 
2.1053 times 10 to the negative 7 seconds. So pretty short time, as you might guess. If I just ran like A, it's so fast to just run A itself that it, uh, it might not measure it accurately, as you can see here with the warning. So in case you get that warning, it's not really a concern. It's just it can only measure things that take a certain amount of time very well. So that's time it. You can also do tick and talk. And here you just put in your code. And then as soon as you start tick, so I could right now say tick, a is 1, b is 2, c is 3, a times b times c talk. And it's been 9.2716 seconds since I did the first tick. And if I do talk again, it's been 17 seconds. Talk again, 20, talk, 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 talk. And if I do tick again, it will restart it. So it just allows you to measure in between uh, this tick and talk how long this part took. So useful ways to schedule and then measure how long things are taking. Uh, the next thing is not timing, but instead we're going to be uh, looking at errors. So with errors in MATLAB, of course, if I said something like this, I get an error, right? Error, blah, blah, blah. And then it gives me whatever it is. So one thing you can do in MATLAB is you can use the process try. And if I say try something end, you can pull up the doc, see the structure of this. Try statement catch statement. So you also want a catch. So when I run this, Because it's an error error, like the editor recognizes it, then it won't run at all. But if I just say A, it'll give me an error, right? Because it's an unrecognized function or variable. But the editor doesn't realize that it's an error because if I change the workspace, this is no longer an error, right? Whereas A equal will always give me an error. So if I can actually run my code, whoops, then I can use try and catch. And if I run it, all it will do is it will try whatever's in here. So I can do multiple lines, whatever. B is C times 11. And if I run this, it will just try to do all these lines. And if it throws an error, it'll automatically go to the catch and run this. So. That's how that works. That's useful in a variety of cases. Another thing is error. Okay, so with errors, I can actually create my own error. And I just do that with the function error and then feed it in a string of what I want it to print for the error. So this is an error. And then when it goes to this in the code, it will immediately stop. So if I add a, it's 11 down here. It won't get to it, right? Because it pops up an error. And when there's an error, it automatically ends the code. So this is an error. Just printed that out because it's specified. And let's say, for example, if A is 11, then you want it to throw up an error of A cannot be 11. Please fix. And let's say. For our scenario a is 11 then end or let's say else you could just display a is not 11 good job so a is 11 uh, then go in here if a equals equals 11 indeed it does then we throw this error a cannot be 11 please fix 
So uh, then we, if a was not 11, let's say it's 12, just display normally a is not 11, good job. So this error is only if you want to actually end the code, if whatever you're getting to is actually actively a problem and you don't want to run the code anymore, then you can just display whatever you want here to describe your error and that's that. So that's throwing up errors. Next thing we'll talk about is managing files and folders. So files and folders. The way MATLAB works is we have our current folder right here, right? You can see current folder that's got everything that's in here, but you don't really want to have to deal with this if you're automating stuff in code. So we have ways of managing this through code. And one way is we can use LS, which will list all of the files currently in the folder. Um, and if I said a equals LS, then when I pull up a, it's a set of characters with each of the things inside this folder here. Um, you'll notice there's also a period and a two period. The reason for this is just how the operating system works. Um, so for this folder, it uses period to reference itself and double period to reference the folder above. So if I'm talking from this folder about double period, that is this folder up above here. And this period is the folder itself. So then we also got all of our files here. So that's how you can list your files and how you can save it in characters. Let's also do another function, pwd. pwd. This is your current directory. So this lectures folder, um, I printed out my current directory, which is in lectures. So it uh, does all the way from your base system. Here it's on my C drive, the user razor, my desktop, so on and so forth. So that's how you can get your existing folder or where you are right now, the file path to it, the folder path. Then I can do what? And we've dealt a little bit with what and which. With what, we can, if I just say what, it will print out all the mat files in the current folder, all of the MATLAB code files, so the .m files in the current folder. So ls is all of the files. What is all the .m and .mat files? So that's what you can also feed in. So if I feed in dot, that's the current folder. So it'll print out the same thing if I run this, right? But dot dot is the folder above. And if I go to the folder above, uh, look through here, I've got a .m file. Here we go. Is non zero is a dot m file. And I can also pull up the doc for what? See a little bit more information. And if I just feed in to what something like graph 2D, even if I don't have a graph 2D, let's go back here. Doc graph 2d i don't have a folder in here called graph 2d or anything so what is this going to return i'll give it a moment oh whoops not doc what graph 2d and it will go into program files matlab r2022a and this path will depending on your operating system but it'll go into your matlab folder the toolbox matlab graph 2d from MATLAB and find that there is a graph 2d folder and this is what's in it. Uh, it's got classes and all of these. So you can use what for that. 
you can also use which and which has a slightly different use so i pull up doc for which if i can ever get that doc which all right which and it displays the full path for the item so if i would say which lecture 10 during class dot m if i do this it will display the total path and if i did which sign it will say built in and tell me where the actual file is for the function sign it also say which cosine it's got a different position so i can actually open this file so now my current folder is in lfun and this at double is just saying it's a double method so i can just look at my sin sign right here i can open my sign function but the way it works in matlab is some functions are built in and some are written in matlab code some are written in c and in this case uh, sign is a file that is built into the executable of matlab so we won't be able to see the matlab code here but this has some documentation so which we've gone over kind of interesting one so now another one we can do is exist so what i can do with exist is i can see for example if i add a is one i could check exist a and one means it's a variable in the workspace great uh two means it's a name with the file extension dot m i could say exist lecture 10 during class that'll give me a two because there's a .m file right here with that. So exist is basically to check the existence of a variable script function, something in the workspace or in the folders. And it works for that. So often you'd want to do something like ex if exist of test name and probably want to just use a variable test name and let's say example class. If this equals one, then display one is variable in workspace and so on. And you may want to do something if it's a variable in the workspace, for example. So that's exist. Now I've got is file. Is file works similar, but is file of example class return false. Why is this? Well, if I pull up the doc for is file, not is files, uh, is file, should return one if it's a file. Well, the reason it's not here, uh, example class dot m. Once I add the suffix there, the file type, it returns a true. So important thing with is file is you have to put in the dot M exist. You do not if you're checking file name. So that's the difference there is folder may work like you'd expect. This folder is a way to check. So if I'm in this folder, if I say is folder lectures, it return one but if i'm in here this folder lectures will return zero because there's no folders in here called lectures all right next we have cd and cd is short for change directory so how i told you that in if i list the contents of this directory or this folder dot dot is the folder above Right, so changing the position relatively, uh, dot dot is up one level because we can think about our folder structure here as let's just start a desktop. Desktop, then that's got a bunch of folders. One of those is UVU classes, and then inside UVU classes is a bunch of folders. 
one of those is ngr, so on. And then in that is a bunch of folders, which has lectures. And so when we say up, we're going up one level like that. So if I were to go up one level from the lectures, I should get into my engineering, which indeed I do. And it just changes where I'm working from to up one level. I could change to exam one or exam folder in here. And now I'm in the exam folder. Go back up and go back to lectures with that. And the slash is useful if you're doing lots of things. So I could go up and then into exam with that. And you can see it does exactly that. So you don't need to include the slash if you're just doing one thing. But if you're doing a series, you include that slash. And back to lectures. So that's CD, change directory. And with all these, we have a lot of tools. We can list our directories, contents, let's say is, or let's go up one, and then say contents is less. And then I could say CD, because it will put the list of everything in here. So let's say I want the folder exam, folder exam is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight down. So I could contents 40 by 58 characters. So I want the eighth down all the rows. And because I'm being a variable, I don't do a space. And there we go. I could get into exam like that. So you can feed them in each other. Of course, if I had just done a space, it would basically be doing the same as making this a string. So which in this case is not what I want to do, but just makes it easier for doing space exam rather than parenthesis, quote exam, so on. So here we are. Let's go back to lectures and let's clear my command window. What else do we want to learn about? Well, one is delete. So if I make new thing test two, say this as test two, save. Right here, I've got test two in my workspace. I can delete it with delete test two dot M. And there we go, it's gone. So delete. Careful with that one, you'll of course be deleting your actual files. So if we want to delete a file, we do delete. If we want to delete something from our workspace, we do clear. So clear ants. So those are the two options there. If we wanted to create a new directory or a new folder, we can do mkdir, short for make directory. So mkdir test. If I scroll up here. It will show my test folder, rmdir, short for remove directory. And it's basically delete the directory. So rmdir, test, and this test is gone again. We can also move file. And let's say we want to move test2.m, or I deleted it, didn't I? Yeah, so I'll make a new test2.m. I don't mess with anything I'm actually wanting to use. S2.m, and let's move it up one folder. We know that's with double dot. So test2 is right here. Oh, it just moved. And indeed, if we look right here, test2.m is now in here. So if I was in here and I wanted to move it back, I would go up to that directory, of course, and then move file test2.m into lectures was the folder I actually wanted to move it into. So go into lectures. It's now there. Perfect. And you don't have to include this. It's just habit because it's a folder. So that's move file. You can do the exact same thing as move file with 
copy file, but of course it just doesn't delete it. So same inputs, it just copies it instead of deleting the original file. Then next thing is actually working with editing files. So we've figured out how to like list all the files in here. Let's say we want to revise a file. And for this, I'll just create a file. But first, you need to know how to use this little function, fprintf. And fprintf works similar to disp. So we have two ways of printing out right now. Disp print this. Then I've got error. I only use if I want to throw an error, right? This is an error. Okay. Next option as an alternative for disp is fprintf. And this is a lot more complicated, but you can just feed in. This is a printing. There we go. But as you'll notice, already it's doing something slightly different than disp. Um, instead of entering right here, it just put the uh, next entry from my command window right in line with this as a printing. So first thing we'll learn is if you want in a st string to have basically an enter here, if I included an enter, uh, test enter, I run this, it will just throw an error, right? So that's why it doesn't like to let you do that because it's not what MATLAB will work well with. So to do an actual enter, you do slash n, and that does a new line. So this is a special character that uh, the slash n, and because we can't actually like put, we have no character for enter or return here, we just do the slash n, and that will make an enter for us. So if I did two slash n's, now it'll enter twice. And I could say it's two and enter. And there you go. So that's how we can do a new line with fprintf. And if we try it on disp, a new line b, So this does not work with disp, right? But it works perfectly with fprintf. And so if you're just showing a string in the window, it's easiest to use disp. But if you want more complex stuff, like controlling new lines and stuff like that, you can do fprintf. And uh, another fun thing with fprintf is you can include variables in it. So let's say a is 10. I can do fprintf of and then a is and then i can do a percent f and then as my second input for my f print f i fit in a and it prints out a is 10.000 right and what this is doing is this percent f is putting in this input right here into the f uh, if it was a matrix so 10 to 15, for example, then it'll just go through that matrix and print this string out with that variable pulled in a bunch of times, right? Uh, and we probably would want a new line with each of these and it looks a lot smoother, right? But with that matrix, we can just say A is 10, A is 11, A is 12, 13, 14, 15, so on. So that's how you can do that, but Maybe you don't want it printed out exactly like this. That's what the percent %f is for. So if I pull up the doc for f print f, so you remember where to look for it in case you can't remember, just pull up the documentation for f print f. And right here gives an example, percent %4.2f. And the percent %4.2 in the format spec specifies that the first value in each line the output is a floating point number. So the F is for floating point uh, with a field width of four digits, including two digits after the decimal point. So the two is the digits after decimal point, 
four is the number of total spaces or character positions that the variable will be guaranteed to take up. So if I wanted F4.2, this would just show 10.00 instead of 10. Point, oh, it's a percent 4.2 F. So let's fix that. Then it does 10.00 instead of just 10.00 with a default number for percent F. So what if I did, let's say 15 point one, it will space this out. So it fills up 15 spots. Um, if I do one, then it of course still has to fill up four positions here, right? The zero, the decimal, the zero and the one. But if I give it a higher number than that, it will automatically space it out. So it'll have however many spaces right before that. So that in total, this is six characters because I can say one, two, three, four, five, six. And each thing here, so if this was one steps of, or 10 in steps of 10 to 100, now you can see it prints it out a little bit nicer because the six here held it at, at with that space. So now they line up and as if this were three, they wouldn't line up quite so nicely in the decimal place. So it's kind of a nice thing to note. And if I increase this, increase the decimal point, of course, the decimal points will still line up. So that's the advantage of, of this right here. Um, and let's look at some other stuff. So present D is a integer, signed integer. So that's not necessarily intuitive, but that's just how it works. It's not an I, it's a D. So present D just prints it out as an integer, uh, which you can do like this as well, right? The percent, the point zero, just means zero after the decimal point, and it won't include the decimal point either. So that's just the same as a D. You can also do a couple other things, um, and we'll go into this in just a second, but where's all of our options? Here we are. So percent is the descriptor. It's like, okay, now I don't want to print a percent. I want to specify whatever is here to be in here in whatever format. So the format is $3 isn't necessary. Got our flags uh, filled with. So $3, that's whatever, uh, whatever I specify here. So if I want floating point number, F, if I want character, C, string, S, so on. Uh, if I want a specific base 10, base 8, base 16, hexadecimal, so on. You don't need to understand the details of all of this, but just if you had to do a base 16 or a hexadecimal printed out, you just print it out as percent %x. Uh, you could do a single character, percent %c, and so on. So if I had a set of characters, this is a test and I did percent %c with a, It'll just print out A is T, A is H, A is I, A is S. Whereas if I did set S, to say this is a test because it'll just convert A to a string. And then this is a test will all be in a string. So if I wanted this space or this new line is new line A new line and test, close that out. I could just do percent S and it'll do this, enter is enter a enter test enter. So that's the details with that. That's how you can print out the variables. So now we 
may not want to just print this out in the workspace. We may want to write this to a file, for example. So that's what you are seeing right up here. Right here, we can use F open and F close, and that will allow us to write into a file. So if you wanted to write, write tabular data to a text file, we'll just walk through it ourselves. But let's say we have x is 1 to 100, y is, or let's do angles. So let's do 0, uh, 0 0.1 to pi, 2 pi, and y is sine of x. Then if we wanted to print this out to the workspace, we could just say f print f, and we want percent f and comma percent f. And I can do x and y, and I can feed in two inputs here, perfectly fine. So I do this. Of course, I probably want to do a new line. I do that, and that works, but because uh, of the negatives in this case, we may want to may want to space it up. But also, you can see that this is not x. Like if I show x, x is zero to six point two. This is not zero to six point two. It's zero zero point one zero point two zero point three zero point four zero point five. It's going left to right. Um, like that. So if I wanted to actually print it out, x's comma y's, I'd probably do something like four x or four position is one to length of x. Then I f print f with x at that position and y at that position. Tap this in, do an end. And now I've got that. But as before, I probably want this spaced over so that the decimal points are in line. That's just a common format of this. So let's say 10 point, and let's say we only want four decimal places. Then we can do the same over here. Well, now, now you'll see that negative doesn't dip it in there an extra spot. So it's a lot easier to read this. Um, and what we can actually do here, if we want to put it in a file instead of just to the command window, we can say my file, just make some variable, and this will be f open. So this is a function that test write file txt, and this is just whatever you want to name your file. So I'll make it a txt or text file um, instead of like a .m, but then in my file will be named test write file with underscores. And it will open that, and to fprint this, I can feed in as the first variable this my file. And looks like I've got an error there. And it says fprintf is writing to a file that is opened with read permission only. Well, that's because f open, it can open a file a couple of different ways. Uh, when you're managing files in a computer, you're used to opening it in the right, um, right as in w-r-i-t-e, not r-h-h-t but you're used to opening it in this method. There's also the read method, which you'll see in some files, like if you're opening a Word document and it's like locked up, it may open it as read only, right? So by default, MATLAB will open a file as read only. So for us to write to it, we have to feed in a second input here of a W. So now if I run this, I'll see test write file is right here. And if I double click it, it's a TXT file that prints out exactly what it was printing out to the workspace, but puts it in the file. 
So that's a great example of when I might want to, let me just close this. When I might want to use better formatting is if I'm printing this into a file and sending it to somebody. So yeah, that's how you can do that. You also always want to F close, just like this, F close of my file. Otherwise it can lead to problems. So now with F close, my file is now not gonna be a problem. And I can open this and it's all working smoothly. So that's writing to files and you can just write a string, right? But uh, with fprintf, we can put in the variables in whatever formatting we like. So play around with that a little bit, but that's fprinting to files. Okay, there's a couple other ways we can manage files. There's lots of ways, but we'll go into two right now. One is imread, and uh, with imread, you can open an image and go into this right after we go to imwrite, which is how you can write an image. The way this is going to work is with images, you have a red R value, a G green value, and a blue value. So in a program or in computers, uh, the way colors are shown is we got pixels and the pixels have a certain uh, brightness of red, brightness of green and brightness of blue. So any color combination can be achieved using this combination of pixels. So with R, uh, we've got how much red. So we have our little pixels. If they're all off, then it'll just look black. Um, and then if we zoom out really far, then it'll be indistinguishable. So it'll look like our computer screen that actually has a purple right here when it's really broken down into a little bit of R and a little bit of blue. So that'll make purple. So that's how it works in computer programs. Colors in here. So matrix, we're at every position right here. This matrix is the one set of colors. For example, this could be the red matrix, and this just has how bright this one point in the image is with red. And then you have a green and blue layered in the third dimension. It's basically got a matrix here, 2D matrix, where at each of these points, it specifies the amount of red in the image, and then beneath it, it's got these other two. This is the amount of red, this is the amount of green, this is the amount of blue. So for this matrix, at row one, column one, depth of one in the third dimension, it's got red. So to create an image, we create a matrix like this that has the red, green, and blue housed in it at the different layers in the third dimension. Let me go back to MATLAB. Here we go. So I've got my file, myimage.png. I can do imread with a string with that in it. When I do this, I get a two by three by three uint date type matrix. So what it's doing is it's got that matrix with two rows, three columns, layered with the red, green, and blue, right? So if I were to want to create my own image, uh, I could say reds is ones, and let's make it let's make it a hundred rows, five hundred columns, and just a depth of one because it's just the one level. So I don't even need this one. And let's say I want it to be full brightness in red. And I could say greens is fully gone and blues is fully gone as well. So when I am right, 
and I'll have to put these together in my image. So image is is a matrix with all these together. So for the all the rows on the column, first level and third dimension, it'll be reds. Image, all the rows, all the columns, second layer in the third dimension is greens. And the third will be blues. So now I've got my image. It's a 100 by 500 by 3 double, so it's not a UN8, but that will be okay. I will just do m right of my test image dot png, and then I can use an m show to show that, uh, and it's my test image dot png. Run this. Received an error. Oh. I need to actually feed in the variable there, image into my test image.png. So I created an image with a hundred rows, 500 columns. So it's five times as wide as it is tall, where the red is full brightness. The green is no brightness. The blue is no brightness. So it's just red, right? If I want it to be white, then I can make it one, one, one. If I want it to be black, I can make none of these colors. And if I want some combination, if I want red and blue, I can do that. And of course, let's say I want less red, half the red. I can do fractional numbers like that and change it that way. So that's how you can create images and I could just create a random matrix. And now it's got a consistent amount of red and greens, but it's got a variable amount of blue. And it creates this pixelated image. And you can kind of see when I zoom out, these sort of blur together. Um, and that's really what it's doing with the red, green, and blue is it's just when you zoom out enough, your eyes can't distinguish between the individual red, green, and blue. And so if I zoomed out even more, uh, Adlab won't let me, but if I could, then when I zoomed out more, our eyes would eventually lose distinguishment between each of these pixels and it would just blur them into one color. So that's creating images. Um, when we pulled in an image, it didn't pull it in as a 100 by 500 by three double. It pulled it in as a two by three by three you went eight and that was just because it scales it when you do an m read from zero to 254 instead of zero to one so if you wanted to recreate that oops, let's go here uh then you can do you went eight of image and Let's say I want the skeleton from 254 to 0. Instead of 1 to 0, I can just multiply by 254. And now I get out the exact same thing. So that's how you can do it that way. Another totally valid way of doing it. And actually, it's the recommended way. Um, but the best thing is if all of these are u and 8, that saves a lot of memory and stuff. So we can make all these u and 8. And you can create the same uh, or a different image because it's random numbers in the same way. And you could, of course, instead of ran, do random i and uh, uniformly distributed integers instead of doing random numbers, and then you could do it from 1 to 254 directly. Anyways, that's all the images, and you can go through, and this is how you could, for example, if you want to just brighten up an image, you can make all of the reds, greens, and blues twice as bright, and then cap it out at the brightest color, but that's how image editors will work, is they'll just revise the individual RGB values 
and manage it like that. So pretty cool that you can do that in MATLAB. And that's the last thing we'll go with in terms of file, uh, editing files. So what I'll say now is there's a couple ways to run MATLAB code individually in a .m file. So if I just write a is one, it will run this line of code, but there's a way to run another file from this code. Let's say my lecture 11 numerical techniques.m. Say I want to run that. I can just type run lecture 11 oops, and click on that. And now, even though I'm in my IO Advanced classes, if I run this, it will do exactly the same as if I went in here and clicked run. So that's how you can run a .m file from another one. You can also do eval. And the way eval works is, or it's a function, you feed in a string and you tell it, for example, a is one, and if you run this, it will run the code in that string. And as you can see, trying something tricky like converting it, if we printed this to a file, it would just be a equals one and b equals two. But eval won't interpret it that way. It'll just run it exactly like this. So you have to be careful Eval is often not the recommended way of doing this if you have to do this, which there could be a variety of reasons why you would. But mostly what it's recommended to limit eval to is something like a equals eval and then do something like log of 10. And then a will be the log of 10. So there are a couple of different reasons you may have to do that. But uh, the recommended way is not using eval. Often it's better to just write to a .m file with f print f and f open and f close or something and then run it rather than doing eval because eval can be a bit messy. So there you go. That's everything. We talked about a couple more built-in classes main ones were cell and structure. Um, then we talked about creating our own custom class, pausing, how to create an error message, listing all the files in a folder, deleting files, uh, creating and writing to files, reading and writing to images, and finally running code in a .m file, but then just directly running it line by line. So there you go. That's all for this time. Hope you learned a lot. Thanks.